It's 1989 in Sweden. Walking through the countryside, up every hill and down every street, you see a group of Japanese tourists. They appear to all be in their 40s and 50s, wearing hats with brims, sporting large packs, and curiously, all carrying binoculars and sketchbooks. They stop often to take diligent notes and sketch the architecture as well as taking pictures with their large cameras with neck straps. This group is none other than Hayao Miyazaki and the Studio Ghibli team, and they were on a very important research trip for their new upcoming film, Kiki's Delivery Service. Often regarded as a simple story about a girl and her cat, Kiki's Delivery Service is much more than that. It's a nuanced story about the struggles of adolescence, freedom versus dependence, and the complexities of our ever-changing world. Today, I would like to explore these themes and the differences of how they're portrayed in the book and the movie. Join me as we unpack the magic of Kiki's Delivery Service. Kiki's Delivery Service was a children's novel written in 1985 by a woman with a striking bob with bangs and signature wide-rimmed red glasses, an eccentric-looking Japanese writer named Aiko Kadano. Kadano wrote the book for her daughter. She was inspired by a drawing she found one day on her daughter's desk of a witch riding a broom with a black cat while listening to a portable radio. The juxtaposition of a witch with magical flying powers, but the ordinary human quality of listening to the radio gave her the idea for a story about a more relatable witch, one who could only fly. She couldn't cast spells, make potions, or turn anyone into a frog. Instead, she would be faced with the same challenges and struggles every other ordinary person faces, with no easy way out. She would have to rely on the very human qualities of creativity, perseverance, and problem solving to succeed in life. Furthermore, Kadano wanted to dedicate this story to her daughter, who was 12 years old at the time, so she made the protagonist of the adventure a similar-aged girl, and just like that, the premise for Kiki's delivery service was born. After the novel's success, just five years later, the story would be adapted to film by the prestigious studio Ghibli with director Hayao Miyazaki at the helm. Kadano's intention with this book is made clear in the foreword as well as many interviews she's done over the years covering her most famous piece of work. She set out to explore the struggles of adolescents and girls and the transition into new, more independent stages of life. A new stage of life where girls begin to discover love, become less dependent on their parents, and learn what it means to be passionate about something. She sets the stage for this journey of self-discovery in the very first chapter of the book where she describes the relationship between a young witch and her cat, as well as the ritual of young witches coming of age. Kiki and her beloved companion Gigi have a special bond, one that is shared by all young witches and their cats. When a young witch is born, her family finds a black cat that's similar in age for her to be raised with, and the witch and the cat learn to speak to each other in a special language only they understand. Then, when the young witch matures, the cat and the witch go their separate ways, finding new life partners of their own. The coming-of-age ritual is exactly the same in the book and the film. The young witch must travel to a new city that does not have a witch living in it, and live there on her own for a year relying on her own talents and skills to get by, and her trusty cat companion, of course. This journey will be particularly difficult for Kiki because we learn in the first chapter that the witches are becoming less and less powerful with every generation. We are shown this in Kiki's life as her mother is able to make a powerful medicine as well as fly a broom. However, Kiki can only fly. She has just that single power. When faced with the great challenge of becoming self-reliant in a brand new city, being able to also make potions would have come in handy. It's here that we see the first glimpse at the author's take on a modern society, and that is a theme that's ever present in this book. Here it is said some witches believe that they are losing their powers because they rely on silence and darkness for their powers, and as the world develops, there's seldom a dark or quiet night. I imagine this was true in 1980s Japan, but even more true in modern times. I can't imagine a single truly dark and silent place. Even campgrounds are flooded with bright lights and the hum of generators nowadays. 
I believe this theme of witches becoming less powerful as society grows is a metaphor for the conundrum that all mothers face, that their children will face a new and unforeseen challenge in a new world that's foreign to them. Each generation has a new set of challenges than the one before it, and it's always been that way throughout all of history. It's true now more than ever. When we think about the world now that we live in where third graders have smartphones and unfortunately unlimited access to the internet at their fingertips at such a young age, this is not a challenge that many of us faced as children, but parents of these children must find a way to help them navigate this new world. The last theme that I picked up on in this novel is that of love and discovering what it is to feel romantic feelings for the first time. We see this in a friendship that Kiki forms with a slightly older girl named Maymay. She gives Kiki a delivery job that she can't wrap her head around. Maymay tasks her with delivering a love poem and a birthday gift to a boy, but she wants it to be delivered anonymously from a secret admirer, saying that she's just too shy to deliver it herself. Later in the story, Kiki eventually comes to understand her new friend's intentions when she begins to feel similar feelings for Tombo. The novel explores the blossoming, romantic feelings of an adolescent and the confusing nature of the whole experience as well as the excitement. When approached to adapt Kiki's delivery service into film, Kadano's initial reaction was no. However, her daughter, the very same one that she dedicated the story to, was insistent that she go through with it because she was a fan of anime and thought it would be cool. There are rumors that when given a first look at the script of the film, Kadano almost halted production due to her disagreement with the liberties taken by Studio Ghibli. I'm not sure if that's true, but I do know for certain that she has a positive view of the movie now, saying in interviews that she has accepted that the film is Miyazaki's work, not hers. She went on to say that film and animation are such different mediums than print, so that she's accepted that although their work is inspired by hers, it will ultimately be a new and altogether different piece of art. I am sure that in retrospect, Kadano is glad that she went forward with allowing the film adaptation due to the fact that Kiki's delivery service has become so culturally significant in Japan. So much so that in a recent interview with Makoto Shinkai, the creator of hugely successful anime movies like Your Name and more recently Suzume, he likened Kiki's delivery service to being equally historically significant to Japanese people as the 2011 earthquake in Japan. It is a milestone in history many Japanese people look at fondly. There are a few references he makes to Kiki's delivery service in his own film, Susume, including a talking cat companion, Guardian, and his inclusion of the iconic song on the radio in the car in his film. Here's what he had to say when asked about it in an interview. While well, Kiki's Delivery Service is one of my very favorite films from director Miyazaki, of course, but I intended the references not only to pay my respects, but also to position Suzume in an extension of our reality, if you will. If the 2011 earthquake exists in the world of the film, then if you look a little further down the path in that reality, Studio Ghibli should exist too, along with Japanese classic pop on the radio. Kiki's delivery service is a shared experience that almost everyone in Japan treasures, so by having it referenced as part of the world in the film, it helps plot these dots that form a line that creates the feeling that the film's world is an extension of our own reality. The film itself, however, faced many challenges. It was one that Miyazaki was more or less reluctantly forced to make. There were many other plans for other staff members to produce and direct, but for various reasons they were unable to and Miyazaki was forced to step in and take the reins. For these reasons, this particular film was not really a passion project for him as his others were. His feelings for the film are reflected in this quote, Even back then, I realized that just like the 80s, Kiki was sincere but somewhat lacking energy. For various reasons, it was a movie I had to make. Commercially, it was a success, but it left me with a personal sense of regret. Some people may not enjoy this opinion, but I can feel this when I watch Kiki's Delivery Service. It doesn't have the same spirit and spark that some of his other films possess. It may be for this reason that it seems to be difficult to find many instances of Miyazaki talking about Kiki's Delivery Service in interviews. Hayao Miyazaki has a reputation for taking great liberties when adapting books to film. 
as I covered in my Howl's Moving Castle video, which you should watch after this one. This story is no exception. He made many changes, but some changes seem to have been made to further his own opinions and expression. The biggest and most immediately noticeable difference between the book and the movie is the tone. The tone of the movie is oftentimes melancholy and downtrodden, however the tone remains ever upbeat and hopeful in the book. I think the book is so cheerful and full of hope because Cardano wrote this book for her daughter and was imagining her daughter in the same situations as Kiki. However, Miyazaki clearly thought it meaningful to also represent confusion and depression that comes along with adolescence and maturity. An explanation for this change in tone can be found in a foreword for an English translation of Kiki's delivery service written by Miyazaki, in which he says, in the original, Kiki solves difficult problems with her naturally good heart. At the same time, her circle of allies increases. In filming this, we had to make a few changes. The process of her developing her talent is surely pleasant, but the spirit of our young girls living in the capital today is not so simple. The biggest problem for many girls is the fight to break through the barrier of independence, and there are too many people who feel like they have not received a single blessing. We feel, therefore, in this movie, that we must give serious treatment to the problem of independence. As movies always create a more realistic feeling, Kiki will suffer stronger setbacks and loneliness than in the original. One way Miyazaki does this is by Kiki losing her powers midway through the film. In the book, Kiki's broom becomes broken and she must learn to make a new one on her own, but she never loses the ability to fly or speak to Gigi. I think these choices were made in the film to show, in greater dramatic detail, the struggles of gaining independence. I also believe that Miyazaki used his experience as a metaphor for the life of a creative. We see this comparison in the scene with Kiki's new artist friend, when she describes the challenges she faces as an artist and how she overcomes them. Miyazaki has said himself in interviews that he finds it important to take time for relaxation, as well as the importance of trying new things to gain a fresh perspective on his work and maintain the spark to keep creating work that he's proud of. In the film, he likens the artist's spirit to the witch's spirit. Here's an example of this philosophy. He wanted to see what he sees every day on his drive to work to get a new perspective of ordinary scenery. So he fastened a video camera to the passenger side headrest to film his daily commute and gain a fresh perspective. Another large divergence from the source material is when Miyazaki made the choice for Kiki to lose her ability to speak to Gigi. This also lends to a more melancholy feel as we, the audience, grieve the relationship and funny dynamic between the girl and her beloved cat. Once again, this further drives home the point that growing up isn't easy and that we often have to say goodbye to things that brought us joy in our childhood in order to gain the independence and freedom we long for. Some people were unhappy with this change and the uncomfortable feelings that come with this loss. However, the author also intended for this to come about eventually, as she states in the beginning of the book that witches and their cats eventually have to go their separate ways. Overall, it doesn't detract from the happy ending either, as both Kiki and Gigi are happy in the new lives that they've made for themselves. The love story and blossoming of romantic feelings between Tombo and Kiki are also portrayed very differently in the book and in the movie. Personally, I believe these differences are due to the vastly different ways that men and women perceive this time of life. Miyazaki portrays Kiki as fickle, not knowing what she wants, and jealous as evidenced by her seeking into a days-long depression that results in loss of her powers simply because Tombo waved at a group of girls. There is clearly more complexity to this scene than that, as Kiki is processing and learning how to understand these feelings she's having for Tombo, but this is often how men perceive teenage girls, irrational and unpredictable. However, this time is portrayed as confusing but also exciting, warm, and happy in the book, and this is how women usually remember this time of life. Kiki is confused initially by her romantic feelings for Tombo, however, by the end of the book she embraces them and begins to show him affection through little acts of kindness and giving him more attention. 
the relationship between Kiki and her mother is also portrayed very differently in the two mediums. I think the difference here is because the book was written by a mother, so the mother-daughter relationship is written in a very hopeful way with Kiki longing to go back home. In the book, when Kiki finishes her year-long ritual, she does get to come back home and visit her mother, and it's a warm and joyous occasion. This is how all mothers would hope to be treated by their teenage daughters. However, Miyazaki took a much more realistic approach to the mother-daughter relationship. He portrays the relationship as more strained and cold, with the mother not quite understanding Kiki's behaviors and intentions. One more difference I find to be significant, but may to an outsider appear to be a small change done for aesthetics, but I think there's a huge message hidden in here. In the book, there's a scene where Kiki and Gigi venture to the beach on a hot summer's day, and when an unexpected wind takes Gigi and a small child out to sea floating on a raft, Kiki jumps into action to save them, only to realize that she is in the air on the wrong broom, and this makes it incredibly difficult for her to fly without jerking in every which way in the air, but she manages to still pull the child and Gigi to safety. In the film, this heroic scene is also portrayed, but instead of a random child on the beach, it's Tombo holding on for dear life dangling from the crashing dirigible. I believe this imagery was intentional. The dirigible symbolizes the modern world, and Kiki must take on new challenges of a changing world that no longer accepts witches so easily in order to grow and become independent. We see themes of learning to accept modernity throughout Miyazaki's works, and I also talk about his sentimental love of Japan of the past in my Spirited Away video. This scene also beautifully portrays the importance of not forgetting our past, and the ways of our ancestors are still valuable enough to save a life. Without Kiki's knowledge of magic, Tombo would have been in much bigger trouble. Overall, despite there being many changes in the way that the story is told, I feel like both the book and the movie deliver the same themes and messages. The primary message being that of dependence versus freedom. Miyazaki said it so well in this quote, This is like someone who wants to be a cartoonist coming alone to Tokyo. Today, there are said to be around 300,000 young men and women who are hoping to make it as cartoonists. Being a cartoonist is not that unusual a job. It's comparatively easy to get started and make some sort of living, but a characteristic of modern life is that once the needs of daily life are taken care of, the real problem is self-realization begins. Kiki is protected by her mother's old, well-looked-after broom, and she has the radio which was a gift from her father and the black cat that she is so close to that's almost like a part of herself. But Kiki's heart wavers between isolation and longing for human company. In Kiki's life, we see this as reflected in the lives of so many young Japanese girls today who are loved and supported economically by their parents, but they long for the bright lights of the city and are about to go there to become independent. The weakness of their determination and the shallowness of her understanding are also reflected in the world of today's young people. Well, there you have it. A deep look into the themes of Kiki's delivery service and how the messages were conveyed differently in the book and the film. If you made it this far in the video, I really appreciate your time and I hope you do something today that makes you happy. See you later! Bye!